Director of the Center for 21st Century Studies. I'm happy to welcome you all here and to uh, welcome you all in Now, uh, Before I introduce Irena, uh, I want to invite all of you to join us on the ninth floor up in the center. After uh, the talk today, we'll have some refreshments and a chance to continue the conversation further um, and look at uh, Lake Michigan. <laughs> It's good just to come for the views, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, so I uh, first met Irene Cloud, right? She was uh, completing her dissertation in philosophy at the uh, Stony in 1996. Met her at a conference on culture and technology, where uh, she did a paper on the Dutch holders and their relationship to the uh, history of Dutch landscape painting. So give you a sense of the sort of breadth of her work. Um, Irena has a really deep experience and expertise in thinking, uh, especially about water philosophy. She's trained as an environmental philosopher, but her work has really, in the last decade or so, uh, moved, not exclusively, but really focused largely on questions of water. In addition to a, a number of academic publications, she's the director of the Philosophy of Water Project in Denton, Texas, co-editor of Water, Cultural Diversity, and Global Environmental Change, uh, Emerging Trends in Sustainable Future, which is a product of UNESCO's International Hydrological Program, and also the executive director of Water Labs, Influence in Art, Science, Policy, and Philosophy, an interdisciplinary conference on water at the University of North Texas, and also currently working on uh, as co-director of the International Environmental, I should get the name of that. Association of Environmental Philosophy. International Association of Environmental Philosophy. It doesn't form a word. I hate or something like that. Um, and she's also uh, made a couple of documentaries, the co-director of an award-winning documentary, The New Frontier, Sustainable Ranching in the American West. So Rena is really a uh, Philosopher who gets her hands dirty and one who works in a variety of different. <laughs> yes, I washed and went uh, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> his face and works in the field as well as uh, in the library. So, anyway, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Thank you, Richard, for that introduction and for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be at uh, such an exciting center as you guys have here and uh, to actually really work with people that are working interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. Uh, lots of universities are still struggling with it and I guess we have to keep struggling with that. So it's an honor to be here and I'm delighted to uh, have had already uh, a couple of very fruitful meetings, smaller scale meetings, brown bag lunch and the fellows yesterday. Uh, so it's exciting to be here again with an even larger group and to share some of my ideas with you. Uh, some of this is in work, work in progress, some of it is already published work. Uh, as Richard said, uh, uh, I don't know if I make my hands that dirty, maybe not dirty enough. Uh, uh, I'm, oh, I'm very uh, much in favor of uh, messy philosophy and I'm really curious uh, to interact with the other philosophers here in the audience um, and uh, with uh, all of you in that sense as intellectuals. Uh, I call it tinkering. We have to keep tinkering, tinkering with as thinkers, thinkers maybe. Uh, we come back uh, to that. And so actually this last project around the meander is my, uh, uh, started actually as a project together with uh, a, uh, a, a group from uh, Cornell Universities around the Mediterranean. Uh, I have a background also in ancient philosophy and has been an old passion of me. And so I took that as an occasion to go back to some of my uh, favorite ancient philosophers. Actually my, f my most favorite is Heraclitus. Uh, and so uh, I was very happy to actually melt my water philosophy with uh, my ancient philosophy through going back to the meander, uh, which as probably not, not many of you will know, but now you will know, is a real existing river. How many of you knew that? 
you knew all one of you. That's awesome. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, when you Google it in Wikipedia, it's like this much about the meander. It was the most important river in antiquity uh, because it was the gateway between the West and the East, like the silk route of water. Uh, really, all the trade went from Egypt and uh, Western Europe, Greece, but also the whole uh, Black Sea region went all through the Meander Valley towards India, uh, China, all the way and back. Uh, and uh, also the main armies went through there. Alexander the Great, Xerxes, Xenophon, they all went through there, either from this direction or that direction. Uh, uh, the Apostle Paul went through Meander. They all were, they visited Miletus, Ephesus, and so forth. Uh, Miletus is the city at the Aegean Sea where the, the mouth of the Meander ends. And that's, of course, the most important city at the beginning of philosophy. That's where Thales lived. Uh, a little more north is Ephesus. That's where Heraclitus lived, uh, also part in that same uh, delta area. It was the area that was colonized by the Greek. Uh, it was called Ionia, a very important region. Uh, Troy is in that region. I'll show you in a little bit uh, uh, a map. Uh, but before they, we go there, it will be actually at the end of the lecture, and so I have to watch my time. <laughs> uh, I, um, I want to tell you that I see it as a meme or model for thinking about water issues and especially about thinking of water issues in its permanently changing fashion, which is demanded by the very issue at stake. Uh, change is always implied in any political, social political complex issue, and water is an incredibly complex social political issue besides that it is a fantastic element. <laughs> And so the beauty of the Meander River, and the beauty, and I'm so happy that none of you knew it was a real existing river. Well, it was the most important river. So the Meander River itself is already an, a wonderful example of how important things kind of meander out of cultural imagination. Like once it was the most important one, now no one knows about it anymore. Till, of course, my work becomes famous, which probably <laughs> never will. <but laughs> But so that very meandering, and that's where I will end with my presentation, uh, I take that as an, a very real uh, activity of uh, watery entities like rivers, uh, but also as a metaphor for how things keep kind of moving along and probably need to keep moving along and also how they keep re-instantiating themselves. Uh, so the word re will be an important word or preface in uh, a lot of my talk. Um, so I'm going to kind of go fast through the urban renewal part, even if that is a very exciting part and, and probably most of you know a lot about that or have more interactions with that, but I want to end up with the meandering part. And so, because that's for me at this moment in time, my philosophical experiment, and I'm going to use you for kind of uh, working with me out the details of my further experiment. Uh, so we will re-meander ourselves through some of this material. Um, so water in the 21st century, we are here in the 21st, in the center of 21st um, uh, century, and uh, I'm very <coughs> excited about it because a main question is, is water actually in this century kind of out of sync? And I spelled it on purpose in two ways. Uh, and I don't know if any of you have seen the H2O stores. Has any of you seen that? Who has seen that? Where? In which city? Uh, this is right outside of Chicago. Chicago. And you? I like it was San Francisco. Yeah, and you? Where did uh, you? Okay, okay. Well, I saw this one in um, uh, Vancouver. And... Uh, it was amazing. I was at a conference and had given just a water talk and then I was kind of wandering around through town by myself and I saw this and I'm kind of, I like kind of sleek architecture. And so I thought like, wow, H2O, oh, look at this, how fascinating. So of course I went in, whole st old store was of course empty. 
uh, it's like French cuisine. You get a big plate and then a couple of thingies on it, you know, and it's very, sp uh, very special and chic. Same here. It's all, it's a store for uh, body lotion and, you know, and all water-based, very healthy and so forth. <coughs> yeah. This was like 2007, I think. And uh, I was treated, I was kind of dressed rather nicely like, like this, you know, kind of, uh, kind of alternative, uh, uh, chic. <laughs> and so I was treated very well. And uh, so, so a woman came to me and like what I wanted. And so and I pretended to be you know, interested in buying something. But it, it was like a beautiful glass uh, shelves with, you know, a couple of thingies on it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I pretended like, wow, it's, I would really like to try out. So I got a little baggie with me home with these uh, little uh, tubes and, and uh, for whatever for free. And I said, I'm going to think I'll come back, you know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> of course, I never come back. I mean, it was outrageously expensive. Um, <coughs> eight, and my point here is, and I always show my students, I, I bring my baggie to my class and show it around. I should have brought it here because it's such a cute baggie with like this really beautifully designed little bottles, as you can see, like this kind of uh, design. And um, the point is, I tell my students, you know, like when you want to know what is in the cultural imagination of a culture, in the and I call it environmental imagination, you need to see what advertisers do. And this is a kind of advertising. I mean, that they choose this name is not for nothing. They have thought about it. It's not like that someone thinks like, oh, it's well, it's going to be. No, they have done a lot of research. I mean, before you design all this, you have done a lot of research. So apparently, this speaks to the cultural imagination. And of course, it has everything to do with our relatively recent body culture, which has everything to do with like this bottled water, spas, and so forth. You know, when I was a student, I actually got a, a degree in political theory of the University of Amsterdam. There was never a bottle of water in, in, in my library. Now every student has a bottle of water. And uh, it has to do with the gym culture. So that all needs to be in place for something like this to appear. And so for me, it's a proof like that water is kind of as I said at the beginning of my article, the UNESCO book article, like water is emerging in unexpected domains uh, as like this, like in this store. And this is only in very expensive cities. Uh, there is one in, in uh, San Francisco indeed, in Vancouver, uh, uh, Tokyo, I think, and uh, <coughs> Seoul, Paris, <laughs> not in Denton, Texas. <laughs> Dallas is a kind of was, is on the verge of opening a uh, store like this. So for me, water, uh, and we will zoom in rivers, a specific body, body of water, is uh, I see it as a connection, as thinking with water. The whole, uh, the little word with will be the most important word in my um, presentation, and the word, the little preface, re. Uh, so. It, uh, it connects a lot of different uh, items, and I'm not going to read everything, but uh, one of the most important things for me is this, uh, that a river as an image and a frame and as a real existing thing connects real places with ideas and ideals. And this, will, uh, this has a lot to do with my concept of culture, and I will come back to that in a little bit. Uh, uh, as, I, as Richard said, I worked at UNESCO setting up actually a program around rivers and cultures uh, in different agencies of UNESCO. Um, usually culture is thought as cultural heritage. That's even the program, explicit name of the program in UNESCO, cultural heritage sites. Um, I want to see culture as also future oriented. And I take my recourse to uh, actually an anthropologist, Arjun Abdurai, who talks about <coughs> culture as the capacity to aspire. So a very a vibrant culture is a culture that uh, gives um, the uh, capacity that affords place and space to aspire, to actually continue to live and invigorate 
invite its own uh, people, places, and so forth. So I see these ideas and ideals as very closely connected. Um, so water is, an, an, is a connecting element in this. Um, as I said, thinking, also being and living. So it is, uh, uh, and I, I wished I had known there were real philosophers coming. <laughs> Usually <laughs> there are not <laughs> real existing philosophers. Uh, because I can give philosophical terms to all of this, you know, this is like epistemology and ontology and aesthetics of water, then usually when you use those terms, philosophers feel more at home. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, you know, don't think that this is all just shallow thought. I mean, this is really <laughs> big words behind it. And, and actually, sometimes it's, it's good to use those big words. And uh, I, I will use a couple of them myself. So I'm not only thinking about with and we. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it has, this kind of approach has ontological implications, has ethical implications for sure, but also epistemological and aesthetic uh, implications. And we will talk a little bit about that, hopefully. Um, so uh, one of the major points of my work is to actually contribute to what I call this environmental imagination. So this kind of, it's not just raising awareness, tell people what they should know, but kind of change a cultural uh, connection to water and uh, to point people uh, at that store of H2O, like, hey, that's not for nothing. That's not just there. It's there for a whole constellation of factors that made it there. <coughs> Uh, and it's one of the ways in which water actually surfaces into our cultural imagination, so many ways. And that's, of course, very beautiful, a store like that, although you, you can also be very critical about it, as, as in some ways I am, but uh, uh, I will go from that kind of store with its sleek, modernist, uh, 21st century radiance to actually uh, the lowest of the low on the totem pole, namely the, the, the infrastructure, our pipes and like who, who we walk on and so forth. But I'll come to, bed, to that in a minute. Um, so again, water is about relations on multiple levels, multiple dimensions. That's why I think it's so exciting uh, because there's almost nothing that's not touched by water, no living entity. Uh, so many mythologies, uh, almost, uh, you, uh, you could read it in the article that I wrote for the UNESCO book, which is kind of nice overview of, of uh, the cultural embeddedness uh, in water imagery and water stories and so forth, for, right from the beginning of uh, written text. Um, but uh, it also relates uh, real local knowledge and interest with environmental protection, governance, many, many different ways. I'm not going to read this. Uh, so for me, it's a shift from ethics as a domain of uh, certain rules to uh, an ethics as ethos, uh, which also include environmental imagination and mediation. And Richard has done, of course, amazing good work about uh, mediation and I use it in a very similar way as he does. Uh, so I see water as a bridge, rivers as a bridge, a link, a mediation that not just bring one side of a river to the other side, but actually intertwine domains. Um, so intertwine humans, culture, human and culture or nature and the environment. Uh, in the sense of ethics as ethos, a larger cultural practice and mentality. So when I talk about environmental imagination or cultural imagination, that's not, that's not imagination as making up things. No, that's an embodied practice. Uh, it comes from actually more sociological and cultural anthropological theory, but it's a useful word, I think, uh, social cultural imagery. And so uh, what I try to uh, accomplish with my project is to reimagine ethics as well a way of living with water. Uh, and so that's not just an epistemological, not just an ontological, it's an intertwinement of all these different domains. Also on the level, also an intertwinement of the local and global. And I could go on about that for hours, 
and just, just point you to uh, the work I did at UNESCO, setting up this water and cultural diversity project uh, in, in one of our uh, smaller scale meetings. I talked quite a bit about this, so I'm not going to do that because some of you are here again. Um, uh, just in short, the main point here of setting up this particular proje project in the International Hydrological Program of UNESCO and UNESCO's United Nations Education Science Culture Organization, and the science division has different pillars, and one of the, one of the, the most important pillar is the water pillar. Only hydrologists and um, uh, hydroengineering folks. And so uh, we, with this particular uh, uh, project, we kind of started to intertwine cultural um, philosophy in that program. It was very successful. We succeeded in actually getting it on their education program in IHE, the, the uh, UNESCO University, which is very important because it gets engineers from all over the world that are there for a short time uh, for two years and then they get a degree and go back to, to Ghana, to Brazil, to China and so forth. And so to instill in the mind of engineers a little bit of cultural ingenuity makes a lot of difference to create that sensitivity. Uh, and so uh, it's a way of making dirty hands but not really, I'm not, you know, working on the fields myself but kind of implied so uh, maybe I'm not getting dirty enough, Richard, but <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so the, one of the results of this project was besides uh, the educational program, as for this, actually this uh, particular book, uh, which is a Springer book, so it's always terribly expensive, but we negotiated with Springer, uh, since it was from UNESCO, that actually certain counties can get, get it for free online. Uh, you can download certain uh, parts. So back to, uh, so that's the, the global, on the local level, I work mil, uh, with rivers specifically. Uh, and as I said, the image is the river as bridge. And as I wrote in my article, rivers have been anchors of, civil, of civilization from the beginning of humanity. Uh, and that makes sense because water is such a vital element. We need water and so it's also the gateway to trade and so forth and so forth. Uh, the word river, rivulet, is actually related to rival. Uh, so it's, it's right there linguistically in our language as that what can be contested also. Um, however, in the 21st century, most of our rivers are shadows of their former selves. And that is because of the shift from 19th to 20th, 20th century. And this is very important because I'm very fascinated by the shift from the 20th to the 21st century, where we are right now. But for, uh, to understand the impact of that shift, we need to understand a little bit of the history. Uh, of course, in the era of industrialization, globalization, uh, many rivers were used. Um, the main ideology of uh, the, uh, the utilitarian approach to river was any drop of water, this is President Roosevelt, any drop of water that reaches the ocean is a waste. Um, now we think like, wow, what a, how can you say that? But in that time it made sense, you know, it's like, it was really not bad thinking. As Nero thought like, the new temples of India are the dams. Now we think like, wow, how can you say that? But it made sense in that era. It was the era of, a utilitarian era of making products <coughs> out of resources, natural resources. Nature is there for us to use. Uh, now we know the effects of that mentality. And so if we build a dam now, we are in a different situation. When we built our Hoover Dam, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, people were proud to be part of that project to bring America into the future. Uh, we have to analyze these kind of uh, projects from their historical context. Of course, there, were already, there was already a resistance against those projects in that time. Uh, John Muir is always the classic example, of course. I mean, he basically died when, uh, when uh, uh, Hatch Hatchy Dam was when he failed to protect that. Uh, and of course, you know, San Francisco is now uh, still struggling with 
uh, how to deal actually with the hedge hedgey in certain ways. But in that time, the majority, and it gave of course rise to the Shara Club, <laughs> So I'm not saying there's no, the, no one had a clue, no, but, but the majority of the culture, the cultural imagination was one of modernity in terms of progress uh, through conquering nature. And so that was celebrated. And, uh, uh, and so any kind of project, large scale project, if you see the historical footage of old newsreels from that era, Haile Selassie came and you know all the major states people came to, uh, um, to celebrate the opening of the dams and they learned from our engineers how they could do that in their country and so forth. Of course in Ethiopia it always, it never, <laughs> that's a whole different interesting story because of course Egypt prevented that Ethiopia could build any dam because that would impact the Nile. Uh, but that, that's actually very interesting, uh, but we are not going to go there because then we are here till tomorrow morning. And, uh, uh, so we go uh, to the 21st century, which started at the end of the 20th century, after the uh, era of modernity came to kind of its awareness of the pollution and uh, so the impact uh, in terms of water impact on water quantity and water quality was tremendous of all those major infrastructural interventions of course major uh, major interventions because of major cities like Los Angeles and um, irrigation irrigated ag agriculture uh, so at the uh, end of the 20th century starting in 1960s uh, a slow kind of turn around came about, which resulted in a uh, change in the Clean Water Act, uh, Clean Air Act a little later, but the Clean Water Act was pivotal for the change of our relationship to our water, uh, and especially to our rivers. Um, and so after the Clean Water Act had really teeth <laughs> and worked, the rivers got cleaned up, and so suddenly uh, where those particular spaces and places were the kind of low places to live for poor people because it was a dangerous place, stinky, smelly, and, and polluting, cleaned up. They turned into real prime, real, real estate. And so you get river festivals. Every self-respecting city has now a river festival. Uh, maybe you guys have one in Milwaukee, I don't know. It's, it's in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, my, the city's front. London, New York, Hudson River Festival, Brisbane Festival in one of the wealthiest festivals. I was invited to give a, a, a keynote address there and it was just amazing what a kind of money <laughs> went into a river festival and uh, everywhere. Uh, we have a river festival around our own Trinity River now. Uh, people are actually tubing in the river, you know, when we tube. <laughs> and like, you know, a century ago, it was called the, the river of death because, <laughs> seriously, because uh, all the slaughterhouses dumped their stuff in that river. So within one century, I mean, and this brings me back, uh, I, want, uh, I hope you have it still in your mind, this is the meandering that I'm talking about, you know, these rivers are meandering epistemologically speaking, culturally speaking, meandering from a particular relationship to completely new relationship in the 21st century, which is very exciting. Uh, of course, it comes with a lot of issues and definitely of issues of planning and zoning and uh, environmental justice issues. In some of the groups we talked already about that extensively. Uh, so it's not innocent. innocent. Uh, it's an uh, often a kind of sanitizing of public space, but what is very positive for me as a uh, 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 political philosopher uh, is that it creates public space. Uh, even if it is sanitized public space in some ways, there is for the first time a focus on the notion of public space, which is of course in the United States a rare good uh, public space. Um, it's uh, an, uh, in urban planning, uh, one of the, the classics, uh, Jane Jacobs uh, or Marshall Berman, uh, for them public space happened in, uh, of, or in Greek philosophy, uh, in the agora or the streets, 
the, the squares, the city squares and the streets. Uh, my analysis of rivers is that rivers actually have a similar function as streets. I mean, not that you can walk on them, but uh, along the, the borders as public space, you meet others. And so uh, in, the, in the middle part of my presentation, I will actually focus on uh, on that function of public space. So besides festivals, you see also more um, social, uh, cultural, intellectual places designed. This was uh, designed by actually Tulane University together with Xavier University as a kind of uh, outreach station. And uh, this got all, of course, um, sidetracked by Katrina, but it, it was one of the most exciting project to actually reconnect people to the Mississippi Riverfront. Uh, and I'm very fond of this particular term, river sphere, because it takes even the river out of its simple uh, boundary of uh, an entity between its banks. Uh, I told earlier that when I talk about rivers, I'm also talking about the land around the river. The river is the whole watershed, the water basin, which again as a philosopher is really interesting. So it's not a simple entity. Uh, good water management start with good land management. A river itself is loaded with silt. Uh, so as an um, element, it's not only water, it's also earth. It's also, of course, air. It's also uh, a solid uh, in its icy <laughs> existence. Uh, but so uh, this was designed like in the 1990, late 1990s. And uh, uh, again, it's for me a, an, an indication of how water and the relationship to rivers is entering the public imagination in real existing material culture. Uh, and is actually very popular. People are participating in that material culture. Um, so it facilitates involvement. And again, when I use facilitation, that's, that's part of the affordance that we talked about in the previous group. Uh, uh, so facilitating means like you give a forum to particular occurrences. It implies an integration of environmental flows and cultural flows. Rivers influence lifestyle and lifestyles influence rivers. So there's permanent this co-constitution. And the word co uh, has its etymological root in cum, Latin, Latin word, which is with. It's constituted with each other, co-constituted. Uh, the same co as in community. Uh, it's being with. Um, so the vision is an inspiring image of a desired future. There's again this uh, aspect of culture as capacity to aspire. Uh, Reimagining the river as a public space relating the general with the specificities. Uh, and I refer in that part to uh, Foucault's notion of the ontology of the present. So you have a larger notion of ontology, but it's always, um, it always comes to the fore through the specifics. Um, uh, so from this ideology, I collaborated on a film project um, to actually focus on the rivers from a cultural perspective, focus on work, play, and ritual, uh, to foreground cultural uh, relationships to many, many, many rivers in our, in, on our world. Uh, here is what I would have been talking about, culture as capacity to aspire. <laughs> uh, and uh, very important, uh, again, image for me is this notion of the trends. And again, water is such a beautiful medium to actually symbolize that trends because it's always in flux. You cannot step in the same river twice, Heraclitus. Uh, you are, it's always transfiguring. Um, and so for me, uh, uh, for me, philosophy is a mode of translation, not from Dutch to English or from English to Spanish, but from one realm of significance to another realm to show how things emerge in various, uh, in various realms uh, and to bring discussion, participation, facilitation to the fore. Um, so questions are in this context, like what guides translation? 
who is translating what to whom and uh, when does it happen? What kind of transformations are being foregrounded? Um, how can we facilitate change versus engineer change? Uh, so that's very important in, t in, in, in thinking about agency, who has agency somewhere. Is it something that just happens or something that we actually decided to do? Uh, these are all very uh, specific but important questions. Um, so that, that's related to institutional, political, and infrastructural changes. Um, and for me, an important question is how can we actually facilitate certain innovations and renewals, especially in cities, and reimagine and recreate our relationship to water. So here you see the re appearing. And this re is just abundant in the literature, in the urban literature around urban re renewal. <laughs> it's all revitalizing, restructuring. So, which is again for me the signifier for the transition from the 20th, 1920s era of modernity to the 21st century. Uh, it's, we are trying to do it again and on another level, on an epistemological level, it's for me an, uh, a symptom of the meandering we are going, we do something again, and we are restructuring some of our rivers completely. Uh, and I can tell you many funny stories about it, especially from my Dutch background, uh, but we can do that with a glass of wine, because it's like there are, and there are, you know, you have the engineers, and then you have, of course, the workers who, f who have to implement <laughs> the stuff, the guys that get the real dirty hands. And I've interviewed some of those workers, like, well, you know, do we, 20 years ago I straightened out this river and now I have to re me end the whole thing. You know, it's like, what is the government thinking? <laughs> and they have a point at the same time, you have to see that in the whole context of our changed relationship to our environment. Um, <coughs> I'm going quickly through some of uh, examples of reimagining our cities and water, and uh, uh, this is my hometown, Amsterdam, and this is all relatively new. It started actually with one, uh, one of our most famous architects, uh, Rem Kohas, who had a whole plan for the Eiuver, that's, the, uh, that's not the canals. The canals in Amsterdam are, of course, d and, uh, they, they cannot be touched. <laughs> they are sacred, they are history. Uh, cultural heritage, but um, behind our central station is a big waterway, which is actually still a, 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 a transportation channel, and so that was always the backside of town. Like most of the transportation channels were the backside of town, well, that's now the center of cultural renewal. It's fascinating, and again, you know, when I was a student in Amsterdam in the 1980s, this was like, these were the, the poor apartments where you could, uh, now it's like, you know, you have to be Yoko Ono to get an apartment right there. And uh, <laughs> you and I all together could never rent an apartment there. It's like, uh, uh, which is not totally true because, you know, Amsterdam of course has really uh, a very uh, <coughs> big, social conscious, so there is also public housing. And, uh, but then you have to be citizen for a long time and you are, you know, you are in the bureaucracy and then you can get in. Uh, uh, so this is one, it's, it's just fabulous. If you haven't been to Amsterdam for even two years, you have to go again because this is brand new. The I Film Institute, it opened like last April gorgeous and you know I don't have a pointer but you can sit uh, well you can <laughs> you can sit right here and have a glass of Chardonnay and look out on the, you know you feel like terribly wealthy to sit there and like enjoy like the big ships coming by and it has just this incredible charm and that's our old film institute uh, and our main uh, music building uh, the Musikgebouw, it's uh, the BIM house, which is our most famous jazz uh, house. All, they were all in the inner city, they're all focused on the eye, that water. Uh, it, it speaks to the imagination, uh, it invites for that. Um, many restaurants and of course a lot of them in old uh in the old industrial area you know you see that almost everywhere like i'm working on another project in uh, manchester new hampshire that has a whole uh turns it mills into a new um, 
uh, buildings for uh, restaurants, small scale business, uh, museums, and so forth. Um, this and, and see the theme of water keeps kind of reiterating itself, like that, that lamp that I photographed right there at the left side is all uh, plastic water bottles. So they kind of are playing with the image themselves on multiple levels. It's really kind of cool. This is another uh, one of the islands uh, that was initially an island for um, oil. Then it became a pirate radio station. Now it's a restaurant. It's fabulous. <laughs> And it's typically Dutch, you see the bikes and so forth, but then you walk over the, over that thing too. Uh, so, um, the question of course, when you have these urban renewal projects that are all just stunningly beautiful and so forth, like those restaurants, they are all rather expensive. Uh, and so, the point here is urban renewal, opening up public space for the larger public well, who can participate in that public? Which, what, who is the public? Who decides for this uh, 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 changes? And um, so it's a question about an, an uh, epistemological question about the expertise, whose expertise is involved. And it's usually only architects and hydrologists and so forth, um, uh, urban planners, developers everyday experience of the people that live there or that are going to live there are often an afterthought. Um, so urban renewal often entails gentrification in short and that's something that you see everywhere. Uh, when I studied in New York, I was a New School for Social Research, the, um, I lived in Alphabet City, now again I could never live in, uh, live in Alphabet City anymore, Avenue B, uh, totally expensive. Uh, all the poor people are moved aside. Um, <coughs> so the question how, and this is a social political question, how can we make low income residents beneficiaries of projects instead of victims? Huge question in all these projects. There's one city, and, and then besides, you know, also the, my last point, uh, it's not only about the people, also about the river itself, the fish, the plants and whatsoever. Uh, one city who did a great job is this city. Do you know what city this is? Yes, this is Los Angeles. And actually my very first slide was of the Los Angeles River. I talked about it yesterday. Uh, you remember my opening slide with that river behind, uh, behind the fences? It's a really cool picture. I took that in 19 whatever, 1994 or whatever. Uh, here, this is the Los Angeles River. <laughs> <laughs> this was behind a high school and I asked the kids at the high school like, do you know where the Los Angeles River is? Never heard of the Los Angeles River. <coughs> I said, it's right there. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that's of course, you know, a, a completely iconic river in the cultural imagination of Los Angeles. You know, it's terminated too. It's in Chinatown, beautiful film about the LA water. Uh, but always as the kind of shady place, you know. Right? Uh, so this is Los Angeles. This is what it's going to look like soon. Actually, part of it looks already like that. And they did an excellent job of not just turning this overnight with a lot of business investment, the real estate developers. They really planned this for years with public forums, with a lot of public participation to make sure that not only Yoko Ono could live here, but also, you know, uh, especially Latino communities. Uh, and this is the brochure that the, that the um, LA City Council gave. Uh, can you read it a little bit? Um, uh, so for me, the most important words are here, again, uh, this creating value on any level, not only monetary value, value on uh, many different levels, through reclaiming, revitalizing, reimagining our river, our future. So it says you could make just a whole, you write a whole dissertation about this, this flyer, because it has so many interesting ingredients, you know. This LA River was for most of the last century not called a river. It was a flood control structure and uh, the, the American Corps of Engineers owned it and that's what they called it. 
And so it was a systematic approach from uh, some journalist poets in the 1970s, kind of wackos that went to the city council and every time when they talked about uh, flood control system, they said, river, LA river. <laughs> and, and it might sound silly, but that's what you need. You need to change the cultural imagination through a different framing of your particular place and space. And this is a brochure of the LA city council. This is not a brochure of some poets or whatever. This is their brochure. And it's not a flood control structure. Of course it's also a flood control structure. It has to be a flood control, fl flood control structure. But it's now and, and instead of or. It's thinking, living with the water. The water is right there and it has its function. Fascinating, that's the 21st century in which we try to redo these things, keep the functionality, but try to do it differently, to meander into a new era, and to call it our river and our future. I mean, you know, you can use Arjuna Padura, I say, culture's capacity to expand, but here it is, you know, they talk about our river, our future. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's that little thingy that we saw before that we never would imagine that that would be our future. <laughs> and it will be our future. Here we are, revitalizing. And the last one, reconnect. And in that reconnect, you have my we and my con, you know, the, 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 the with, both cozy together. <laughs> that's the future. Then we have Dallas, Texas. We do it a little different there. Uh, but we have our urban renewal project. Of course, it's top-down. There's no mu not much public engagement. Uh, this is the Trinity River uh, outside town. It's, it has nothing going for itself. It's a slimy, murky, muddy river. The, its charismatic megafauna is the alligator gar. Uh, and in one of my articles, there was a picture of it that I made myself. Uh, it was almost scary. It's like a prehistoric animal. It's like, really, it's prehistoric. And, and it, it, it's like the uh, herons, you know, the herons are prehistoric. Uh, this, they are one of the oldest fish species. They are bottom feeders. <laughs> it means like they eat everything. They're really dirty. Uh, and they look ferocious. They are scaly. They're real scales. I saw one that big. And they have a beak, a long beak with teeth. <laughs> that's, our, that's our charismatic mega fish. And, and it's really interesting because it was always seen as like this, this awful fish, the alligator gar. It is re-meandering in the cultural imagination actually as a special fish. And you, 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 it's now, um, gosh, how do they call it? I forgot. But there's now a whole website of people that catch an alligator gar and like, you know, they're all like, uh, it's now, a real charismatic species, which is so fascinating. All in 10 years time, you know, things are changing so rapidly, but even not only the river, but also its species uh, are gev getting a different place in the culture imagination. Texas is a river state. We have a lot of charismatic rivers like the Rio Grande, of course, lots of films, poems, and songs about it. Trinity, no. That's the, it's in one song, and uh, I love it, song, uh, the Texas River song, but it, it's like the place where you, it's muddy, it says only in the song. Uh, along the Brazos, you meet your lover, but uh, the Texas, the Trinity is just muddy. <laughs> uh, it's the most important river, though, in the state. No, I cannot say that the other rivers have also important functions, but it has it, the most people around it. Uh, it's, uh, as I say here, like it's... Um, uh, it's 25% of the state population lives around the Trinity River. Anyways, just to give you a sense, <coughs> uh, oh, one of the details here is actually we have one of the highest water uses, 260 gallons per person per day in some regions, not in whole Dallas, but that's an amazing amount. You know, like in the, in the poorest countries in the world, they use like nine gallons a person a day. Like in usually in, in, in probably Milwaukee has 110 gallons a person. But I mean, this is outrageous. <laughs> you know where that goes to, that water? Who has an idea where the water goes to? 
No, it's, this is the urban region. This is not agriculture. Usually, most of the water actually, 70% of the water usually goes to agriculture. You're very right about that. But this is an urbanized region. No. Lawns. Lawns. <laughs> Lawns. You see the importance of the cultural imagination. And really, Dallas is working hard to actually show people that they don't need a lawn to, to look wealthy. That actually, because that's the whole image, you know, you, they, they, a lot of Texans want to be like the East Coast. You don't want to have a lawn like, you know, like the old plantations had and like they had in England. We want a lawn because we want to look English. Uh, but that you actually <coughs> can have beautiful zero scaping. So they have big campaigns for that. This is the Corridor Project, beautiful project. Actually, a couple of really nice things, nice Audubon Center and so forth. And we have a Calatrava Bridge. <laughs> Every <laughs> self-respecting urban renewal city around water <laughs> has a signature bridge. And uh, I'm going to show this around. This is transforming Texas waterfront. And you cannot really see it, but this has a lot of it. This is not only happening in Dallas, but in a lot of different uh, places in, in Texas, like in other states, like actually in other countries, Seoul, uh, in my own country, Europe, lots of all talk about a signature bridge. <laughs> of course, not all city is that wealthy that they can afford a Calatrava bridge, but of course Dallas could. They were actually planning originally three of them, but then we had a little economic dip, you remember? <laughs> <laughs> so now we have one, which is still, you know, more than most cities have. Uh, I showed uh, from this side actually the, the urban plan, just for you to get a sense of the materiality of the culture of the uh, how this is d disseminated, this knowledge into the cultural imagination. Um, it was a big event of opening the bridge. I went to it. Not, they had two events. One was for the real, you know, all the donors. That was with Lyle Lovett. He had to buy a ticket for 150 or 200 dollars, 200 dollars. So I didn't go to that one. The next day, it was free for the normal people. <laughs> it was really nice to walk over that br bridge. Uh, this is the brochure that I'm sending around just to give you a sense, transforming Texas waterfront. And this is a mayoral initiative. These are, uh, these are the mayors of all kinds of smaller towns, bigger towns, and so forth. Again, to give you a sense, this is not an isolated phenomenon. Uh, and I love that they call it transforming Texas waterfront. I go, I skim over my Denton, Texas, uh, uh, stormwater plant, you read, you could read about it if you haven't done it in uh, the article that I disseminated, it was on the website. Uh, my main point is you don't need Calatrava bridges only to reconnect to the waterfront. It can be also your local, really cheap little local detention pond. Re and I call it reclaiming water infrastructure, playing on that reclaiming and the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, but reconnecting the visible, invisible, and the potential. Uh, so the point here <laughs> is like we can, we can politically decide to design things differently. Like usually those thingies, uh, as the LA River was called the flood control channel, these uh, flood control ponds are called soil conservation services, Hickory Creek Basin Retarding Pond. They are all called not, not Hickory Creek, but they are all called SCS, soil conservation. There you see again, like water and soil are always connected in the management because that was the crucial uh, problem that too much water got, uh, too much land got eroded. And then they are CSC 16. So this was number CS 16. There it is. That, that's the way it's on the official maps, CSC 16. Now if you see, if you would see that, that's my question here. Would you go out there, head over there with your kids and... Uh, no, because it's CSS 16, it's a stormwater feature, you don't go there. But now they changed it into a park and here it's doing its work as flood control. You know, when we have flash floods, it's, it's really flooding. <laughs> and this would have gone in town, you know. They, they, they designed this after uh, a big flood in Denton. Here's my dog and uh, it's on the dike. My dog is an Anatolian shepherd, that's important, keep it in your memory. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the dike that's, you know, very Dutchy. I feel very much at home in my hometown. And uh, it works. It, uh, and here you see the, 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 the Frisbee players. Uh, you get fantastic birds. Like, 
really uh, yellow crowned night heron uh, because we are right on the flyway. Uh, Texas is the most birds of all the United States because we go from south to north, uh, southernmost border of the northern bo birds, northernmost border, border of the southern birds. We have our own guide, bird guide. You guys don't have that. Here you have a couple of folks. I don't know who they are. They're always different folks. They actually, those guys are often there. Uh, all kinds. This guy I actually do know, Chuck. <laughs> uh, um, this is an old guy, Bob, who was always there. Uh, retired folks, folks of all kinds of background. Beavers. You can interact with the wild species. Well, usually these wild species are actually duckies that you know people gave to their kids for Eastern and then of course it was a big hassle so they dumped them in the pond and most of them cannot fly because you know they and then they are out on their own and uh, I'm not there the whole day I'm there only after after school to walk my dogs and um, but like Bob is there you know big parts of the day so I always hear, hear from Bob the latest news and then it's like you know a couple of family drove up in this big you know, this big van, and they dropped like two duckies, and the duckies walked, ran up behind the fan, and it also was so sad, but, but now they have a life in the pond. Uh, just one uh, quick, uh, because we are running out of time here, um, this is the beginning of uh, also the, the <coughs> rainwater or stormwater features. Oops. It's okay. <laughs> this is one way I also work uh, with uh, some of the artists in our town, town to bring more awareness to the wastewater um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, so we designed this uh, to bring more attention instead of just this, which is very, maybe you have this in your town, you know, no dumping drains to, uh, to stream. Well, no one <laughs> sees this. This, people are really stopping and seeing it. And what is this? Think. <laughs> it's a beautiful design. School kill, uh, children work with it. Uh, I designed this whole flyer, and it, uh, it was uh, kind of the background of this whole project. Uh, it is a beautiful, actually, um, uh, the television became a local news. So the think part brings us to the last part, to the meandering. And think. So this is one of these, you, you just saw it in reality, uh, but this is her artwork, it's really pretty. Think, so how are we, I, I've sketched already a lot of ways of thinking about these things, but now I want to think in the, in the, in the, the last five minutes about this in relationship to meandering. And for me, meandering is very important because our culture thinks in terms of efficiency, you go from A to B, shortest line, that's the way to go. And uh, I think in a lot of ways, we need to rethink our thinking. We need to re-adjust uh, our uh, projects. And so that we, that I have emphasized, is for me a, a <coughs> metaphor for meandering. So this is a plea for meandering. Let me say a little bit of history here is meandering. I think this is all there is in, in Wikipedia, which is just amazing to me. <laughs> it's a proof that it's not part in, of the cultural imagination anymore. It's just a river somewhere in Turkey. You know, and uh, you know, it's good to cover all these things. Uh, we don't have to know it's a real existing river. Here it is. There is Anatolia. That's where my dog comes from. I can tell you much more about that. From uh, uh, it's not for nothing. It's because it, this is an area of mainly sheep herders and so forth. Uh, and so the meander is uh, is right here at the Ionian coast here. Uh, Troy was here, uh, Miletus is here, Ephesus is here. I mean, this was the center of the world together, of course, with Egypt, what is here. Uh, and, and then, of course, the Eurasian and Asian uh, uh, groups. But here happened the very first philosophy, very a uh, lot of activities right there. Not anymore. Totally gone for uh, since, you know, uh, first century after Christ. Um, here, not a, uh, the Aegean Sea, you get a, a better sense of, you know, the, some of the famous islands and so forth. From the beginning, it had an important ring. It was actually Herodotus who brought the meandering, meander as a cultural recognizable theme into literature and history. 
uh, he wrote about a meander as the uh, river because it had so many meanders, so that became the symbol for meandering itself, the meander. <laughs> he, talked, he, he wrote about the Nile as a meandering river already. Uh, it became this key pattern. You see that now in uh, almost every self-respecting like 19th century building. Look on it from now on. You see it, uh, library buildings, uh, uh, buildings of um, uh, uh, courthouses and so forth. They all have this meandering uh, pattern. Uh, this is Meandros. <laughs> at least the Roman imagination of Neander. He was, of course, a god, the son of Oceanus and Tethys. Uh, and see, you see also the symbolic uh, of the Meander as, uh, in, in those days, of course, the Meander was a floodplain, uh, and so it was uh, an agricultural area. <coughs> so it was food production in that, in that area. Uh, and so the cornucopia is right there. A uh, very important figure in those, in that was actually instead of in, in uh, Athens, you had, of course, Athena as the main goddess. Here it was Artemis, and there's a lot to say about that. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but it's fascinating because in the Greek culture, Artemis was a kind of, uh, she was the goddess of the hunt, and so it was more of the barbaroi, of the kind of underdeveloped folks, uh, but she was very highly... Um, uh, culture there. In the 19th century, there was a little revival of the meander. Uh, very interesting. This is an old uh, travel guide um, that has this picture of the meander at Miletus. And, uh, it's a, it's a, a German uh, travel writer who was actually the consul for a while in Turkey from uh, Germany. Uh, so this is what happened with the meander. You see my leaders is like right here, which was the harbor, very important, that's where Thales lived. Well, the effect of the meander, of what I told you, like it has silt, <laughs> is that this is all silted up. Uh, and it's partially because of the use of the meander also. Uh, uh, but that's what happens with a living river. It changes its harbors also. It changes the whole land around it. Um, Right now, I'm now going to, the last uh, part of this is, uh, I'm going to transition from the meander in antiquity. And so I showed some of its relevances in it, and I can talk about that for hours, but we're going to not do it. For me, what is interesting for this audience at this point is to, again, give the transition from uh, the meander out of our cultural imagination, and still out of our cultural imagination. Even Anatolia is not that much in our cultural imagination. Turkey is emerging in our cultural imagination for a lot of reasons. Here I want to focus on the environmental or the, the use of their uh, environmental resources, as you, they usually call it. Uh, it's a big tourist destination for uh, many other European countries, uh, where that was in the beginning of the rise of tourism in the 1950s as a new phenomenon. That was all Spain, Costa del Sol and so forth. Now it's Turkey. Uh, cheap tourism. Uh, Turkey itself wants to become part of the European community, therefore they have to go through the political hoops of what the Euro European community demands, and it means like every river needs to have a water framework directive, and so they have written their water framework directive, their water plan for the Meander River. Of course there's no way to control like what it all means, if it's done correctly. What is interesting to me as a uh, philosopher interested in cultural studies and cultural phenomena and, and also the epistemology, like how do people inscribe themselves into a new era? You have to go through this kind of bureaucratic hoops, and this is again a material manifestation of that. This is a long document, and they, they went to the length to translate it in English. Uh, I've, I've read the whole thing, and. Here are a couple of other, you know, how they do it. It's like, uh, like all water framework directives look like this. <laughs> and so, it, it, you know, you get all the information and so forth and so forth. Uh, I want to close with this, how meandering, so I have now used the meander as a kind of what I call a meme. Uh, meandering has, of course, a place in our language, usually as the, as the movement of rivers. We all know what that means. I'm not going to uh, read that definition. Uh, this is one of the most stunning books of images about the Mississippi when it was not 
kind of castrated by the American Corps of Engi Engineers. It was a completely meandering river all the time, hopeless. <laughs> so I want to end with the meander from its real existing uh, activity uh, as a fluvial activity to meandering in our cultural imagination. Um, in, um, uh, in the Greek period, it was already the signifier of a focus on uh, Marcias, that's another, uh, that's the more uh, satyr-like figures versus the Apollo figures, that were the Athenian figures. In contemporary uh, culture, I would say it's the, uh, the shift from hydro-engineering paradigm to a local cultural paradigm, or for that matter, a paradigm from Western culture to Eastern culture. Uh, or <coughs> a, a paradigm from progress in terms of utilitarian control of nature towards a meandering, towards a model of integrating cultural components in engineering and culture at large. Uh, some, there are some artists that work in this kind of uh, context. This is a famous uh, artist in Berlin at the School of Architecture there, Yang, Yang Liu Design. She had a whole show that was called Ost trifft West, and that's German for the East meets the West, which is, of course, in Berlin, a very uh, loaded theme. Uh, but she meant it much, much, much larger. And I would say she, meant it, she means it in, in the uh, context of my meandering. Uh, <coughs> so this is her, she gives uh, all her work has these kind of contrasting, uh, so this is the West, the, the blue is always the West, and the red is the East. Thank you so much. Keep meandering. <laughs>
I refuse to call this practical. I refuse that on the purpose, on the, for the reason that uh, that's what a lot of philosophers think of environmental philosophy, like, oh, this is a fight, folks, you know? As if we are in our attic and thinking of these things and then apply it. My main point of the whole thinking of me meandering and meandering is that in and through thinking about real existing decisions and material culture, uh, we are actually rethinking our thinking also. Uh, and that's why I end with Jean Liu, like uh, that her visualization of those mentalities is simplified, but that, that, that's the kind of beauty of it too. And for me, that's very, uh, actually very deep thoughts uh, to think that through. Uh, but it is a thinking through with practices. That's why I emphasize it with the whole time. It's the rethinking by thinking with. And that has thinking with, with always has to um, relate to rethinking things because you're not thinking it anymore isolated. I'm curious, um, because it seems so much of the narrative is um, rethinking cultural relations to water. But to me, the driving force behind a lot of these reworkings of water are rethinking more ecological systems or, or from the perspective of the ecological health. Uh -huh. And so how that how does that figure in your thinking? Right, all right. Um, yeah, interesting. Because again, you know what I want? I want to emphasize this with. Uh, so it's not only um, uh, the engine is not the ecosystematic approaches only, but it's I'm thinking through how that percolates to use a lot of matter into a cultural imagination as something relevant, as something they want to actually go to city council and uh, ask for certain different ways of planning their infrastructure. Uh, so it's, again, what I call co-constitutive movement. The very fact that this ecological thinking finds traction is because the culture is open to it, is ready for it. Uh, uh, I always give the example of the Cuyahoga River fire, you know, uh, uh, I spoke about it earlier that when that, ha that happened every 10 years, but only in the 1960s, it was something like, wait a moment, this is a river of fire, this, that's amazing, and it should not be. Well, that was, that reaction was possible because there was a general sense in the culture and imagination that this was something bad. So I guess what I'm saying here is that uh, when you say like, well, isn't this, uh, these changes, aren't they uh, instigated by actually a change in ecosystems? Yes, but that that, that change could take place has a lot to do with cultural imagination. So uh, you see it's, it's a co-constitutive force. Uh, and that itself has consequences for economy, for sociology, like for your point. Texas, uh, uh, there's a big debate about, about certain developments versus keeping actually the birds tourism to finance that. And so that, that's a really interesting, uh, you know, you get also always the jobs versus nature argument, but actually there are jobs in and through nature. I mean, when you go to the whooping cranes in uh, Mother Gorda Bay, I mean, that's a big business. Of revenues that comes in uh, uh, around those, those birds. So it's uh, again, it's the nature culture together. Uh, uh, but of course, the the very fact that we know the effect of the uh, of dams of major infrastructure on our waterways has to do with ecosystems. So we know now that we have. The, the most precious ecotones, like the fresh salt water ecotone, 
are all endangered because of major water infrastructure. And so that itself brought ecosystems all together as a system. So you, you see, it's always co-constituted. Yeah, that's kind of all the Leopold and some of the philosophers' background. And, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. This is a very good shot, so we really appreciate you coming here to share it with us. Um, I actually know a lot of concerns are quite well because I'm an anthropology and I have a piece from other people have guided me in the world a few times. It's a good in some of my classes. Um, I think, you know, it, it also draws out some of the current themes. And one of the nice things she does with that book is to show um, the very diverse perspectives um, on the watershed system, on the part of the farmers and the industrialists mm -hmm. and the hospitality industry and the Aboriginal owners and uh, the residential population in the area. And of course, not all of that cultural imagination fits together in lockstep, right? And some of the, for example, the approaches in terms of um, ecosystem redesign and, and trying to uh, work towards sustainability has also been uh, very much locked into, in some, in some contexts, it's, it's also had a lot to do with uh, a more neoliberal gentrification scheme, yes. um, and can also be used as an excuse to reallocate uh, water access and water use um, from public to private or um, from different kinds of public uh -huh. to, to other kinds of and so, how do you imagine this? Um, I, mean, I, I really love this, this trope of, of the meandering river. I guess for me, the sense is you know, perhaps there are many rivers meandering at the same time yes. in terms of the cultural imagination yes. of uh, this environmental landscape. So, how do you? Yes, do you yes. yes. thank you. Very nice question. And I, I completely agree. I mean, it's, I've, I've been thinking a lot about it. And it's, uh, it becomes like one river, as if there is just one cultural imagination. And that's, of course, definitely not the case. Of course, there's always a dominant kind of cultural imagination. But uh, I can kind of wiggle out of that problem <laughs> by, uh, by means of, you know, a river has always come to street. It's a watershed. Like every drop of water that falls in a water basin comes to this river. I mean, it all have a different trajectory, all the droplets. And so uh, I don't want to completely individualize the issue, but there are creeks, mm -hmm. there are little tributaries, the Miami, of course, call those tributaries. So I would kind of deal with that. And then, of course, they don't have to all come into the main channel. So there, there is some limits to it. But I, I think there are limits to any kind of metaphor. Could be. Uh, but I, I totally agree with you that, it, that that's one of the drawbacks. Uh, but I think I, I still like it a lot because it is, it has this, um, it's evocative in its, uh, uh, trying to do something again. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of uh, epistemology of experimentation, embodied experimentation, is so important. It, it brings the search back in research. You know, searching for something, finding a way, given, and it's in, given the embankments, given this, the larger structure. We cannot just do anything. A river is not just, cannot just go somewhere else. But at least it's a different model than stepping in the train and go from A to B. Uh, you are, at least you are uh, going with a flow. And there are, of course, a different, a lot of entities are picked up along the ways, which is also a really beautiful, uh, there is so much can be kind of folded into the metaphor. Uh, and uh, so, I, but I think your point is a good point. So, in, in, when I, uh, I'm about to kind of finish this in an article for the, the Cornell book, but uh, I, I have to give kind of disclaimer indeed that there is this, this danger of unification as if we all come together in one flow. Then, you know, on a meta, meta, meta level, we do, but <laughs> it's hopefully not that interesting, you know, logically speaking. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. What? It's primarily used for her. Right, but you know what? It is at least primarily the only kind of stuff I can on twice either, I guess. So I have a comment and a question. I mean, I really love the metaphor of the meander thought as meandering and the contrast with the kind of A to B right. direction. And we were, I mean, the humanities, we were talking at the Roger Committee in the center today about the crisis in the humanities that's you know, happening right now. And that's one of the ways that crisis gets, um, the first the comment and the question, uh, one of the ways that crisis gets played out is that in a kind of neoliberal climate, there's an idea that education should be about a connection from A to B, uh -huh. a straight line, and yeah. then we should, you know, an education here should produce a job here, a right. outcome. And in defending humanity, one of the things I think that we're needing to do is to defend, or to defend a kind of practice like me, and I mean, there are many other metaphors for it as well, but the fact that, yeah, you might start at A, and you might take a lot of directions, you may not know where you're going to end right. up at right. the end, right. and that that doesn't mean that it's not valuable because you can't see a direct connection. So I think the model of meandering, you know, is one that we could perhaps use right. in our defense. But the question then is like, is more about how you I guess to talk more than about this meandering uh -huh. method. And so you're drawing this from the natural meander of the river in general, how would you, other philosophers I think have also advocated forms of thinking that were more like meandering mm -hmm. than like straight uh, mm -hmm. proceeding from line to be. So I guess I'd be interested in you placing this model of meandering as a form mm -hmm. of thinking in relation to the philosophical tradition. Who else do you see as doing something like that or doing something that in coming up with a metaphor draws on uh, or follows natural models. Right, so right, right, right. Very, very nice question. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, Wittgenstein. And he doesn't draw on the river, although he has riverbed metaphors, very interestingly. But uh, I'm drawing on his notion of his uh, epistemology of uh, what understanding means for Wittgenstein. Understanding for Wittgenstein means seeing of connection. And to see connections is, by definition, complex. Uh, and, it, and I love that quote because it, it has the nice con in it. And then con, actually, I trace back to, uh, uh, I mean, an analysis of Heraclitus. So I would say Heraclitus starts already, but, and not just because, you know, it's a kind of almost postcard. <laughs> but when you make an analysis of his notion of logos, uh, it has always already a connection to thesis and um, I've done, I've done, done a kind of textual analysis. It's, it is always when he uses love, there's a notion of sim with it. And the, the Greek equivalent of whom is sim, like sympathy, symbolic, you know, they, they, the sim in Greek or synthesis, the, the M and the N are linguistically uh, more into each other. The sim is, is is the width. And uh, so logos and fuses are much closer related than people actually. Right? So I would say there's a long tradition right. actually uh, with Heraclitus, but also in you know the, the like 20th century thinking, like Wittgenstein, of course, Malaponti thinking, the chiasm, the uh, body and embodied body, the flesh, the uh, cognitive with the bodily function is very, very much into this tradition. Again, like I mean, it's a very good question because I should spell it out more and, uh, because it's not an it's not an obvious connection, uh, but it's all lingering in the background. Uh, and of course, contemporary thinkers like social movement, but also Latour, of course, with his notion of uh, the um, uh, between determinism and voluntarism, there is this kind of thinking that things are not going in but all, all it means. And so I would say that that kind of thinking in terms of means, means not for the end, but one means, means to other means, and so things are commonly co-constituted in that sense. Uh, co-constituted in itself is for the term of Husserl, um, so it's from that tradition, but like uh, Latour has clearly I mean, you are not calling me a dream because 
I did that. I was joking, but I mean, that, that's, it's a similar uh, mode of thought. So I'm happy you raised the raise question because it's important to point out. Like, uh, so of course, Foucault, I, I did quote Foucault with the ontology of the present. So that oxymoronic presence, uh, you see it also in say Jean Luc Nancy, where's a really all, was built on ontology, on being, any being is being with. So there is actually some explicit philosophy that deals with that. But um, again, you would not think in terms of rendering. Right. So there are some figures I couldn't mention many more, but I think that's enough to give you some food for thought. We can talk more about it later. You had a question? Oh, yes. When you talk about man, Henry, and about um, uh, popular thinking, I think very much fracking now has become not just in one country. It's becoming right. a worldwide issue. So do you, ever, do you ever include that and sort of like how how that is is becoming part of the world thinking in terms of? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a silly answer that I want to give. You know, I told you how apartments is in Rwanda of Washi, one of my other colleagues does that. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a silly answer, but he is like, well, he's just about fracking and so forth. And, uh, um, which is really good and, 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 and important, and of course there's a lot of water connections because it, it's, it's an awful situation for the water quality. Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it takes so know. much water, there's so many. In the beginning I was kind of, uh, uh, I did research some of it, but there's also so much you can do. So it's kind of too much for me to kind of take that all into consideration also. Uh, however, I have to say that of course, you know, we, uh, in, in, in Texas, we invented the tracking <laughs> uh, already a long time ago when it was not economically feasible. Uh, and so the Barnet Shell, where, where we are, is, is like the most fracked area. I mean, you fly over <coughs> our, our country, you see like everywhere there's pads, you know? And like right now, there's, there's a fracking site very close to town. And so there's a lot of protests against and a lot of activities. Uh, also, you know, every South, uh, South East Stephen University is now sustainable and has sustainability council. And I actually started one in my school like 10 years ago. Very successful. We are very proud, you know, officially our, our school in the logo Mean Green because we have Bill, Bill Green. I don't know much about football, but he was very important. <laughs> so, so we are, it's our logo, we are Mean Green. And of course, now we are green. We, we mean green. You know, it's like all that kind stuff and uh, very important very good but we have and we have new windmills next one we have a lead certificate stadium one of the few universities that's right there and we, but then we have a fracking site right there still you know because it makes money for the school and uh, I kind of like these complexities uh, but I, I cannot be part of everything in that so, and my colleague is doing such an amazing job. He's such a, a, a young, energetic, I'm already old. And I know I feel old, and I feel also already a little old. And I think it's beautiful to be old, and he's so you know, 30s and energetic, and has this beautiful analysis and philosophy of science. And at the same time, he is at city council meetings. I, I don't know the end. That is very important. A lot of my students are here. I don't mean the end of our stairs. <laughs> <laughs>